Hi, I'm Jeff Hurst. I'm an undergraduate working for Dalton Research Group at University of Washington, and this is an attenuated total reflection device. This is a device used to analytically measure R33 or the electro-optic coefficient. So first, I'll go over the device setup. It begins with the 1310 nanometer laser, passes through a polarizer, into a prism, is incident on the sample, and then passes into the detector. This device works by coupling a sample to a prism using a pneumatic piston. Samples are an ITO glass slide that has been spun coated with a polymer and chromophore host, which is the material of interest, and then sputter coated with gold electrodes. This material was then pulled using a Tangman and Sichu polling device. First step in mounting the sample is to check the pressure reading on the piston. When mounting the sample, we want the pressure to be set somewhere between 10 and 20 PSI. If the pressure is too high, when the piston is applied, the sample could crack. It's important that the point of the pneumatic piston lines up directly over the upper gold electrode. So we slide the sample in here in between the prism and piston. And we carefully align so that the point of the piston rests just over the gold electrode. When it's properly placed, we activate the piston, which will then press the sample against the prism. Once the sample is properly aligned, we now want to increase the pressure on the piston so that the chromophore and polymer host film couples with the prism. Coupling will occur when we see what we call a wet spot. To achieve the wet spot, we adjust the pressure carefully until we can see a wet spot with the lowest possible pressure. Once the sample has been aligned and a proper wet spot is obtained, um, we now connect the wires leading from the gold electrode and ITO to these clips here. In this case, the bias is not important, so either wire can be connected to the red lead. Once the sample is aligned and we have a proper wet spot and the electrodes are connected to the leads, we then want to calibrate the instrument to this particular sample to achieve maximum signal to get the most accurate reading of R33. To do this, we select the Calibrate tab and we click the Run button in the upper left-hand corner. Once running, the program will display two lines. The first is the diode intensity coming from the detector. The second is the lock-in intensity. This is the electrical signal coming from the wire leads, from the lock-in amplifier, and then to this graph. Now, we want to rotate the sample and prism setup to search for modes. Modes are points at which there is total internal reflection. These occur at what we call critical angles. So we will rotate the sample to find these critical angles. Once we have found a suitable mode, we begin calibrating. So first, I will begin rotating the sample to search for a mode. I do this by clicking any one of these motor control buttons. The lower buttons move continuously or in large steps for scanning across large areas, and the upper buttons move in small steps to fine tune. So the computer controls the motor, which will then slowly rotate the stage in micro steps. During the calibration process, we'll scan across a full range of angles on the sample searching for modes that occur at critical angles. At these modes, there is total internal reflection inside the chromophore and polymer host film. These modes will be represented by a sharp dip in diode intensity and a simultaneous sharp dip in lock-in intensity. Once a mode is found, the motor needs to be fine-tuned so that it rests 
at the angle which corresponds to the lowest point in the diode intensity or what you could call the lowest point in the trough. At this point we then want to adjust the laser and wet spot to gain the maximum signal or to increase the amplitude of that trough corresponding to a moat. To adjust the laser we use these two rods here which will correspond to X and Y translation. We'll translate them in each direction until the peak amplitude is found on the diode intensity trace. Then we will adjust the pressure of the pneumatic piston to change the wet spot or coupling of the film to further maximize the amplitude of that diode intensity. Once the sample has been properly calibrated to achieve maximum signal, we want to move to the measurement frame of the program. Do this by clicking on the measure 2.0 tab. It is now important to zero the sample or set it to its zero angle. To zero the sample, we can scan across a full range of angles to find the zero dip in reflectance, or we can align the incident laser with the reflected laser out of the prism. Here, we can see the two beams on this two photon card. So we will fine adjust the motor on the stage until the left dot lines up over the right hand dot. Now I have adjusted the motor so that the two dots have merged into one. This means the stage is now zeroed and ready for measurement. Now that the sample has been calibrated and properly zeroed, we can begin measuring. To do this, we click on the measurement 2.0 tab in the program, and in the upper left hand corner, we will see an informational box where we can put in the username, the chromophore material used, the host polymer, concentration, sample number, and the lock in sensitivity used. This information will be attached to the data we take during measurement and stored on the computer as an electronic notebook. In the lower right hand corner of the information box, we can see a box labeled steps counterclockwise. This tells the stage motor how many micro steps to move beyond the zero point. If during the calibration process we find modes at very high angles, it may be necessary to increase this number. Often we increase it to a number as high as 2850 micro steps. However, a more standard number is 2500 micro steps. Once the information has been inputted, the instrument is ready to begin measuring. To do this, we click the run button in the upper left hand corner and the stage motor will begin rotating very slowly across a range of angles indicated by steps counterclockwise, searching and recording modes that it encounters. When we open the data tab, we select the data that we have just taken based on the information we entered. We then see a printout of the diode intensity and lock-in amplitude here. These dips correspond to modes. From the amplitude of these modes, we can determine the R33, the thickness, and the refractive index of this particular material. It is important to note that if there are less than two modes, we must enter a thickness which we have previously determined as Thickness can only be determined from the modes if there are multiple modes. To fit the data, we first want to indicate the number of modes present. Here, I see two clear modes, one here and one here. So I will input that there are two modes. Once we have designated how many modes there are, we want to select the step numbers that correspond to these modes. I will guess a value of negative 1200 steps for the start of mode 0 and the end to be at approximately negative 900 steps. For the second mode here, I will guess the start to be at negative 2600 steps to approximately negative 2200 steps. Now that we have selected starting and ending points, for our two modes, graphs will appear in these boxes below. The left hand side shows green traces of the derivatives of the diode intensity for the first and second modes 
and the right hand side displays green graphs of the derivative of the lock-in amplifier response for the first and second modes. We want to fine adjust our two modes starting and ending points so that we catch one full amplitude of these derivatives. Looking at these graphs, we can see here that we can move this in to pick up only the lower point here and get rid of the excess. Similarly, down here, we can adjust our mode starting and ending point to remove this excess area here. To do this, I click these buttons corresponding to each mode to fine adjust the step mode number. As I click these buttons, you'll see the derivative graphs change. Now the graphs capture one full amplitude from peak to trough of the derivative of both the lock-in amplifier intensity and the diode intensity. From this fit, we can conclude that our values for R33, refractive index, and thickness are now correct. This sample reports R33s for each mode to be 36 and 38.6. That's a relatively close agreement, so we can guess that the R33 is thus somewhere around 37 picometers per volt. The thickness it reports is 1.39 microns, and the refractive index is 1.7. This data seems logical and the fit looks good, so the fitting process is now done and these values can be recorded.